Good evening. My name is Daniel Young. I'm the owner and founder of Adapted Perspective and the Adapted Perspective social media platforms. And I'm back with an update on the market and how we can use closed-end funds to improve our investing. Uh, this is an unedited video. Who knows what you'll hear in the background as I film these in my house. I am not a financial advisor. I am a financial strategist, really just an overall, uh, overall strategist. And I don't speak like the herd. I walk in limited company, and sometimes I walk alone. So what changed? A crazy week in the market. The end of the week was much better than the start of the week. However, the market is still down. Um, but it, it, it just seems the newbie investors seem to have had their fears assuaged. But spin it however they want, we're not out of the recession talk just yet. I still say we're in a recession. We're slowly moving into something worse. Uh, Brett Owens of the Contrarian Outlook team agrees. His article on uh, 814 echoes the same. Uh, he says a lot in that article, but he leads in with, if history is any guide, we are certainly on the clock for a slowdown, if not already in one. Slowdown recession. Uh, JP Morgan still put the recession percentage about 35% for this year, 35% possibility that we have one officially this year until somebody changes the lingo. And Donald Trump recently warned of a recession next year. And let's see, the market at large still thinks the Fed waited way too long to curtail rates. And then as of Friday, the national rate on mortgages uh, still sits around six and a half, but the number of refi uh, refinance applications increased almost 35%. So let's kind of put this in perspective. The hope is that the Fed cuts rates in September. And I mean, yes, I hope they cut rates, but infl inflation is still on the rise. So if they cut rates, that's kind of, that's very counter narrative of what they've been saying. I mean, their whole purpose is to control the economy and to control inflation. And if inflation's on the rise, it makes no sense to cut rates. But, you know, we'll see what they manipulate next. So why refinance ahead of a rate cut? When rates drop, home values will go up. So people would rather pay a lower People would rather pay a lower, though higher, than normal rate with lower home prices factored into their loan than wait for the, for the home prices to go up and have a lower rate. Uh, you're, you're essentially financing more money. So as we move into another increasing, who knows, another turbulent market week, um, Gosh, really just a market season uh, ahead of this presidential race. So have you ever stopped to think about the average dividend of the standard S&P 500 stock? I mean, it, some pay none, some pay some, but the average is 1.3. 1.3. That's crazy. Not only is inflation eating your gains, if there are any, Right now, you're, I mean, the, the average, I guess, on the market is still down. So maybe you're ahead of, maybe you're ahead of the curve, but the average is still down. So not only is inflation eating your hope for gains, it's killing your dividends. But if you remember why I like closed end funds, closed end funds win the dividend. Like there's not a battle, there's not a skirmish. They just they all out win. They give us access to great funds with better than 8% dividends and price gains, and they sell on discounts. So we get low risk, we get improved upside as the discounts close, and then we get access. Crazy cat. We get access across investing platforms. So on that 1.3% average of dividends, our Roth account currently generates just over 12%. That's almost nine and a half times higher than that S&P 500 ball and chain. So what are we investing in through closed end funds? Like why, why, how, everything are we getting access to those 12% dividends? Well, before we get bogged down 
on the specific targets, you need strategy and a filtering system to even start to begin to filter to, to filter and kind of shorten down that list. So the strategy is that we see the big picture. We see the current market, but we also realize the market looks ahead. Like we're playing the current field, knowing that it's a much bigger deal than just tomorrow. Got to play the long game. Market looks ahead, right? So where's the market going to be in three to six months, but where's it going to be in 10 years? You have to think for yourself. You've got to have a strategy. You got to be able to sift the data, track the herd, invest where the herd is not, and ideally try to buy what the Fed cannot print. And strategy wise, our strategy is to be able to supplement a retirement or, or fund a retirement with dividends. Now we want price gain, but we want dividends. So, and that, that's, that's very different than your average, average seasoned investor, but also just average, um, it, it's very different from your average financial advisor, which I am not, but it's also very different from your average investor. Most average investors are hoping to, to gain in capital gains. Like you buy the age, the age old example, you buy Apple for five and you sell it for 10 and you make $5 a share. They're hoping for those sorts of gains. And if they get a dividend, they're happy. Ours is different. Like we want the gains. I mean, who, who doesn't want to make money? But we also want the dividend. We want consistent payments, right, that we can fund a retirement with. So let's see. See the big picture. Play the long game. Think for yourself. And then use the closed-end fund system, meaning our strategy, our, our closed-end fund system and metric, that formula, sifts all the data. It takes favoritism out of the mix. I have favorite funds, but if they don't meet the metric, then they don't meet the metric. So instead of playing favorites, we apply the system, we use our code, and we let it work. Now, what kind of code? An investment code. So I like nautical things. I use a lot of nautical references. So in that, it's kind of like a pirate code. We, we follow the code unless you have a reason to break it, more like guidelines. So you got to know your strategy, right? Our strategy is dividends, right? But what are you currently targeting? What's your strategy? Why are you doing it that way? And then you need to determine your targets based on that grander scheme data. So that macrocosm thing, right? You look at all the macro data, and then you condense that into how it's impacting your world. But at the same time, you have to see all the macro data so that you have a long-term target system or a long-term strategy. You have to buy historic discounts, which means you have to do the homework or you let me do the work for you because I'm doing the work for me. Just take my data and use it for you. You focus on consistent and rising dividend payers. So when and how they, when and how they get paid matters. I mean, are you, do you want it paid monthly or quarterly or semi-annual or annual? I mean, the annual dividend just doesn't really sound great because you got to wait one time. you got to wait for that one day to get paid once, monthly. Quarterly, if you if you have to, monthly. Uh, and then you want to be mind, mindful of the overall dividend yield. Our focus has been 9% plus, unless there's a good reason to pick up something smaller. So has our overall target list changed? No, it's still high fixed. Uh, it's still high yield fixed income bonds. It's still bonds in general, along with loans and real estate. And then it is some select tech funds. So let's walk through this and I will walk you through our system. And let's see where the bargains are for the week. So this is the closed end fund master. It gets updated weekly. Uh, purple, dark blue, green, and light blue get updated weekly. The entire system gets up updated monthly. And we're looking at buy alerts. So I go through and I, I mark all the buy alerts. 
the buy alerts just mean the existing discount is greater than double the historical discount and it's greater than the five-year discount. And if the company's relatively new, like this company, there's a little wiggle room in that. Two asterisks would mean it's a dollar cost average alert based on what we already own. One asterisk is we track for any number of reasons, but we're only looking at the targets. So we take our target list, which the overall list has shortened considerably. This means the options, the options list, I mean, this list used to be twice as long. It took a while to really sort through everything. Uh, but it just means the options are a little, little easier to, to handle, really, a little easier to filter out. So first, we take out the ones that are not monthly. Next, I mean, they're already significant. That's, oh, uh, I guess we can do this. Insert, shift right. So if we already own it, current would be we already own. So let's see, of what we already own, this is inside our Roth portfolio. And then if I was going to look at the individual uh, price per share versus what it is now. So all of these targets are significant. So after we sort out when they pay, now we come over and we look at yield. We want 9% and above. This one's going to stay on the list simply because of the crazy discount. Real estate, it's everything, honestly, like bonds, loans, real estate, those rates and the money generated in those rates should go up when, when rates drop. So it's kind of like, it's like the pause before breath. Uh, it, in that uh, in an individual basis, we think of real estate rates in regards to money. Like when the rates go down, you wouldn't be gaining as much. Um, think of how to explain this. Like if I thought about it from a personal standpoint, Falling rates are great for me. I wouldn't think it would be great for the, the actual real estate loan company. But it's, it works more like bonds. When rates go down, bond prices go up. When rates go down, real estate prices go up. Uh, HFRO's portfolio is like half online. And they switched from bonds to real estate for a reason that I really don't know why, which is reflective in their price and that discount. People are kind of in the same the same thing, like you've got a hedge fund built on bonds that pays an outstanding dividend. Why would you switch into real estate? And no one really knows, at least I haven't seen an answer why. So that's why everything's been shaky. Their uh, dividend was unsustainable, so they cut the dividend in half, uh, moving from bonds to real estate. Their real estate portfolio is about half online from what it sounds like. So it will be great in the coming years. But in, in the meantime, we're just kind of waiting for that to happen. So in a rate cut market, it should help real estate. Uh, and I'm going to leave it on the list. But at the same time, we're not going to add any right now. You could argue for adding it right now. I mean, you could make that argument. Uh, current average. 6.3, I only know this because I did the math earlier. Current average is 6.33, essentially, uh, of what we have. And if we picked up 100 shares, it would drop our overall average to like 6.13, 6.18, there we go. Uh, so, I mean, it would bring down our overall price of share. That's a good thing in the long run. And I, I mean, I, sadly, or fortunately, I, I could argue for all of these, but I, I would, I'm going to end up talking myself into a corner or talking myself around a merry-go-round.
Um, so let's filter this out, at least of how I would filter this out. I don't like paying above, I really don't like paying above 12 for anything. Uh, but we already have investments that, look, a typo. We already have investments that meet what this has. So, no. and then if I'm not going to pay for that, I'm not going to pay for this. Utilities, uh, for this portfolio, we missed the utility bandwagon. We're invested in utilities in this individual account. But I, I have no plans to buy utilities towards the top. Um, and yes, they're on discount. Uh, newer fund. But yeah, rising price. Um, not gonna buy not gonna buy utility right now. And that leaves us with this list. And these are very similar portfolios, but there is a pretty key difference that I wanted to go over as I as I filmed out this list. So ETW and then ETB. ETW, which I'll get to, ETB. Let's look at ETB first. It's it is it's heavily weighted tech. And not as much so. I mean, it's it's more heavily weighted than this one, but we'll get to it. It's, I mean, it, it, they have a ton of stuff in their portfolio. They just do. It's very similar to the other one, but it's it's weighted very differently for the the five or six at the top. Still five, still five. NVIDIA, Microsoft just switched, right? Microsoft almost at eight. Microsoft at five. NVIDIA, 7.26, pretty much at five. Apple at seven, 7.25, below 5%. Amazon close to 3%. So I write in the right one. No, Amazon at 4.4, .4, Amazon at 3.1 almost. And I, I heard a great summary of structuring portfolios. And if you ended up buying a closed-end fund like this or other funds in general, uh, it's, it's like a 2% rule. You keep, you're trying to not so much balance your portfolio, but you're going for almost like a 2% investment in everything so that if one thing does bad, it doesn't weigh on the other side or on, really on anything else inside your portfolio. And this is, we'll say everything at 2% or less. There we go. Um, and that, I mean, the top four are above 2%. Maybe you could argue for that one. Um but this one is weighted heavier into tech, which is great right now because of the tech market in general. It, I don't know if it's going to be great long term. Um, and it's not to say they wouldn't switch it in, in the future at some point. But I do like this one a little bit better on how it's weighted. I also like this one a little bit more because it just seems like it has more in it as I go back and forth. So... To go back to this list, to get almost the same portfolio side by side, but weighted just a little bit differently, I would go for the uh, go for the cheaper option, which also has the better dividend. So this is a direct play on 5G tech. This is more like an indirect play on 5G tech. If we look at their portfolio, every one of these companies is not a straight technology company, but every one of these companies needs technology. So that's higher than it was. We did, we, we sold it in the individual just to pick up another 50 spot in the Roth. But since we bought it, whatever day the 12th was, Maybe Tuesday, maybe Monday. 
Monday last week, since we bought it Monday last week. 1180, it's gone up 40 cents already. Um, so it's as tempting as it is, I got to take it off this list. And that leaves us with this. So everything in blue we own, the green we do not. So this is bonds. It's not high fixed income. It's not a ton of, or it's a ton of corporate bonds, but at the same time, not a, not a lot of high fixed income corporate bonds. Uh, they've expanded their portfolio, even from here. It is, um, it, it's a ton of money in, in assets abroad, but it, it's crypto and closed in funds and uh, precious metals and so much more than just what's pictured here. HGLB is bonds and a mix of things. FSCO is a giant bond company. And on the opposite swing of the pendulum, CIF is a small high fixed income bond company. And HFRO is just straight real estate. Some loans and bonds, but really not a ton. And this one's just all stocks. So as I prep the video for the week, and I, as I go through these funds, and also as I look at our portfolio, like, yes, this is our portfolio. It's everything but our account numbers so we can't get in. Um, and there's the, the full update on BRW. But as I look at what we have, Corporate bonds, corporate bonds, real estate with some bonds, real estate, 5G tech, taxable loans, which are kind of like bonds, some more real estate. And as I read articles for the week, it's, it's, say, inside my head, I can justify all of these funds, or at least I can make a case for all of these funds to play the current market with the hope for coming rate cut. Rates go down, bonds go up. But quite honestly, it should work that way for everything else. Rates go down, everything else should go up. But it's, are we in a recession or are we headed for one? And if we're, if we're not in a recession now, which we're, we're in a slowing economy. And regardless of how the news and all these other places want to spin it, we're in a slowing economy. So when the presidential favorite comes in and says, hey, we might have a recession next year, that's not concerning, but that's kind of like, it, it, it piques my interest because one, it tips me off that for sure, not everything is how the news spins it, which we all know that in general. But it's it's almost like a, like, hey, it, we need to, I, I don't want to say change the strategy because the strategy has been high fixed on income. I mean, the strategy has been this, high fixed income, bonds, loans, real estate, stocks, and tech. And we are weighted on the bonds end of things, bonds end of things. And I guess in challenge, it's like, should we consider just a straight stock option? A closed in fund who specializes in all stocks, a global account, um, a ton of money in management, Yes, like yes, all of these categories you can group all their all the companies and funds they own in these categories, but at the same time, they're all companies that need technology. Um, and then in a coming recession or or a more severe slowdown, however you want to reterm it, uh, since Merriam West Webster already got caught. Re redefining a recession about two years ago. Um, 
it makes me hesitate in picking up more bonds. Like if we're going to try to focus on what does well, what what is historically done well in a recession, like insurance or healthcare or um, all like flu season products, if we're going to focus on that stuff, we don't currently own a fund that has outside. We own a fund inside the individual account, but honestly, we, we want to sell. Uh, but we don't own a fund like that in the Roth. And it makes me pause to consider, should we add it? And the of this list, the best way to add it would be this fund. It also makes me think of Warren Buffett. It's diversificate. Oh, I'm going to botch the line. Basically, it, it's... It's not that you want a diverse portfolio. It, it's stop spreading your money around and focus on what you know works. Like don't just diversify for the sake of diversification. That, that's pointless. That's foolish. That, that's a waste of money. So in a coming rate cut, bond prices should go through the roof. Uh, or at least they should go up. The dividends should get better. And it should stay the same in a recession. But should we add another general stock fund in the portfolio? That's kind of the question. That's where I, I pause. So the options I, I foresee in this, or I guess that my what I'm going to end up sleeping on, is we can do this one of two ways. Or I guess three ways, to be honest. Every coin has three sides. Um, and your decision is going to depend on your portfolio. So if it's us, we could just not buy anything. I mean, that would be an option. Or we could hit the other side. We could hit the, the giant flat sides of the coin. We could pick up 100 shares of ETW and have a small amount left. Because, and like, why not spend it all? So if we, so we have that, if we bought that, that would be the remainder. The current dividend is about 118 a month. And we would pick up a dividend this month if we bought that on Monday. So that would leave us with this, which would still allow us to pick up another 100 spot of this small bond company once dividends were paid. Because uh, honestly, my goal was, original goal was to pick up 300 shares of this and just allow it to climb back up. So as rates dropped, allow it to pick back up on overall price. And then when it once it hit... Uh, three dollars which seems to be its curved trajectory uh, once it hit three dollars to sell it and then invest the money forward so that's a option so pick up 100 shares let our dividends get paid come back and pick up another 100 100 shares of cif that's one option the other option would be to stick with bonds um, right. Really, it's like a split option. I guess you could. We could stick with bonds. We could also pick up real estate. Right. But I could make a case for all of these. Like giant bond company, super super high fixed income percentage. Uh, so the the longer that rates are higher, the better that these two companies will do and pay out. But really the same is true for any bond company. But I mean, the corporate bonds, fixed income world. Um, yeah, you, you'll end up with a greater return. So I, I could argue for that. That's why it's having the system makes it much easier. Because if we go back to the original list, that's a lot of fonts. It's a lot of color. 
how do you how do you pick it? Well, you shorten the list and you make it easier. But it still comes down, it still comes down to target and what you want to focus on. And I could make it so BRW, I, I've said it before, it's an activist closed in fun. It's active, it's it's advocating for shareholders. But by investing into them, I also get access to bonds. I also get access to a ton of closed in funds and crypto and precious metals. This is uh, it's bonds and real estate and um, they've changed the portfolio a little bit. Some utility work. It's also higher than what it's been. 774, 71. Really don't want to raise our average. Take that one off. So that one's higher, but not by much. That one's a little higher, but not by much. That one's a little higher, but not by much. This one's lower. The real estate, uh, which makes it a little more tempting in that regard. So we could pick up 100 shares here, pick up 100, 100 shares there, and still have a little bit of money left over. Right, that we could then take our dividends and then maybe buy something else. Um, so, I mean, one option is to not do anything. The other option is to pick up 100 shares here in stock and then come back and pick up 100 shares in bonds. And then the other option would be to pick up 100 shares of real estate looking forward. So as their portfolio comes more online next year, so that They'll pay the dividend now, but of what the dividend used to be. So they'll more of their portfolio will come online, meaning up running and generating money next year. And then it'll be better than that two years from now in a much better rate market in theory. <laughs> but that's that's kind of the deal. Like you buy the you buy the dividend now, hoping it hoping it'll go up, but also like feeling confident that it'll go back up. But what's the best thing to do for Monday? And to be honest, I got to sleep on it. Uh, it. It's still working through my head of best options and possibilities. Because I could just as well make a case for these. Um, 400, I think, is the, the number to beat at the it, it, maybe not the number to beat, the number to match. Um, I'm comparing prices. VRW at 729 would raise it, would, would lift it up based on like if we picked up 100 shares. FSCO at 623. It would lift the average, but not by much. HFRO, pick up 100 shares at 590, would bring down our average considerably. And CIF at 175, just because I've already done the math, really would just put our average right at 1.72. And then it would just hang out and sit as we wait, as we wait for the rates to change and their curve to go back up to about three bucks, which is why it's tagged like that. So I mean, normally I end videos with like, this is what we're going to do. Like the last video I did where it was, this is what we're going to do. And we did this video. It really is sides to a coin. If you're looking for, uh, depending on what your portfolio needs, if you want a shareholder, advocacy company that's brw if you want high fixed income with a ton of money just a ton of fun uh say a ton of wealth and assets that is for sure fsco they've grown uh they have considerably grown uh cif is still exceptionally well run just on the on the opposite end, ends of things on total assets uh stocks with uh, technology needs 
and then real estate. And if we're playing this, we have done our we have done exceptionally well investing in high fixed income and and bonds for sure. Stocks we have been laggard on. Uh, I mean HFRO like all. This is stocks, but I guess of when I think of stocks, it, it's stuff like this. So I don't want to diversify just to diversify. I want to diversify into what will help us best long term. And that's kind of what I need to weigh out overnight. But in general, this is the top five for the week. I could argue for them all. Uh, but what I'm on the fence about is buying 100 shares here to come back and pick up 100 shares after dividends are paid here, or just going outright, 100 shares in real estate and 100 more in uh, corporate bonds and high fixed income, and then seeing what we have left after dividends are paid as well. Uh, I, I, I do not want to, uh, I don't want to wait, I mean, this week shouldn't be shaky. We'll see what the, I mean, look, there's a Federal Reserve symposium this week. We'll see what comes of that. Um, yeah, really, I really am. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to think about it and sleep on it. But see what your portfolio needs. That's my advice. Buy what's best for your portfolio. Um, and whether that be bonds, stocks, or real estate. So, that's all I got. Otherwise, I'll just be talking myself in a circle and taking more of your time. And I don't want to waste your time. So if you like my content, if you like my honesty and transparency, consider subscribing to my channel and then hit the like button. And it really does help push out videos. So whatever your future holds, wherever your ideal destination of financial freedom lies, None of that stuff's going to happen on its own. You really do have to work for it to make it happen. So if all of this sounds challenging or like you haven't considered this stuff before, my advice is sit down and figure out what it is, that, like what's your purpose for investing? What are you hoping to gain by investing? Yeah, yeah, money, I get that. What are you hoping to gain by investing? And once you know where you want to go, it's much easier to chart a course to get to that destination. But just kind of, you know, we're back to talking in nautical terms, but, you know, piloting your boat, uh, captaining your boat, however you want to say, it's easy to let the boat just be steered by the winds. It's easy just kind of kind of randomly steer it without purpose. But once you have a destination in mind, it's much easier to drive your boat to that spot. Dealing with the stuff that comes up along the way, because you, you're now purpose driven. That's very different than uh, chasing butterflies, going where the wind takes you. So if your goal is a certain level of financial freedom, you have to drive your boat to that. You have to pursue that objective. You can't just do it all willy-nilly and hope for the best. So figure out what it is you want and then point your course towards that and go get it. Make it happen. So whatever you have for the week, I hope it goes well. And if if navigating your finances sounds confusing, come find me on Facebook. Uh, my, my Facebook group is navigating your finances, but we talk about everything from getting from like starting out with facing fears, walking through the process of getting out of your full-time job and, and helping you get to the level of financial freedom you need. So whatever you want to do, make it happen. And then I will see y'all on another video. So hope you have a great week. See you at some point. Bye-bye.